Cockle Bay is located along the coast of Aberdeen Creek. Its first inhabitants started settling in the 1940s, as they were the farmers and caretakers of the few agricultural plots of land that existed there at the time. Then, with the construction of Abizine Bridge in the 1980s, Cockle Bay, and specifically the community of Jemata, expanded as it became home to the labourers working on the construction of the bridge. Within the next decade, due to the devastating civil war, migration from the rural provinces into Freetown further increased Cockle Bay's population, causing it to quadruple in size from 5,000 to 20,000 residents. In recent years, this growth has been exacerbated through unaffordable housing in formal parts of the city. As a result, a significant number of residents within Cockle Bay resort to land banking, as it's an opportunity to acquire land affordably. This has been progressively expanding Cockle Bay's area into the mangrove and wetland ecosystem, especially during the last 10 years. The ongoing expansion of banking is enhancing the likelihood of risks such as flooding and health and sanitation conditions through creating an unstable and vulnerable built environment. In turn, these risks are decreasing land tenure security and certainty to stay as this area has been classified as risk prone and thus leading to eviction threats from the government and the NPAA. Furthermore, the fact that the mangrove forests and the wetland ecosystem of the coast of Cocoa Bay have been classified as a Ramsar site since the year 2000 and thus requiring protection from degradation further contributes to the incentives for evictions. In response, the Memorandum of Understanding, an agreement between the community, the local government and the NPAA, was developed in 2018 to prevent further banking in Cocoa Bay. The MOU aims to protect both the natural and built environment along the settlement. However, an end to further banking may result in future problems, primarily the densification of the settlement, which is likely to pose pressures on existing housing and access to basic services. Thus, certainty to stay and capacity to upgrade both individual housing and community services are two elements which are under threat, but at the same time can be potential entry points for improving conditions in the settlement. In light of these circumstances, our research aims to identify the key factors that enhance certainty to stay and capacity to upgrade individual housing and community services, in order to form a foundation for breaking the risk accumulation cycle faced by the community of Cocoa Bay. In the past year, initiatives such as the Memorandum of Understanding and the Community Action Area Plan have been produced with the aim of supporting the communities of Cockle Bay amongst other settlements of Freetown. The Memorandum of Understanding involves an agreement between the communities the National Protection Area Authority and the government to achieve zero banking across the four communities. Moreover, the Community Action Area Plan was established as a tool for communities to advocate their rights and acquire a participatory decision-making tool for future interventions. Building upon the principles of these initiatives and their work, our six-month next hub research and two weeks on the field experience aims to further contribute to the trend of supportive initiatives seen recently in Cockle Bay. Finally, through the Mayor's Plan Transform Freetown, Amongst other settlements, Cockle Bay is called upon to take part in a citywide plan of transformative change. In order to contribute to the work of these initiatives and thus make our work suitable for both government and community involvement, we have worked upon four areas of focus which are shared with the Memorandum of Understanding, the Community Action Area Plan, and Transform Freetown. These four areas are zero banking, which is shared with the Memorandum of Understanding, and then individual upgrading, community upgrading, and funding, which are all shared with different sectors of the Community Action Area Plan and Transform Freetown. These four areas will be explained in the coming sections. Our research focuses on three main objectives. Firstly, to understand the drivers that create and reproduce the banking cycle. Secondly, to explore levels of vulnerabilities and exposure to the risk accumulation cycle. And thirdly, to identify factors influencing residents' certainty to stay and capacity to upgrade their housing and community. To unpack these objectives, we conducted a range of research methods, including transect walks, 21 interviews with key informants, 107 household surveys along the coast, two focus groups and a participatory workshop. Building upon last year's fieldwork and our findings from the work co-produced with the communities, we identified four areas of focus which can together form the basis for enhancing residents' certainty to stay and capacity to upgrade on both individual and communal levels. These four areas comprise the four pillars of our strategy, which are zero banking, individual household upgrading, community upgrading and funding, which respectively correspond to the Transform Freetown goals of 
urban expansion, environmental time bomb, the water and sanitation gap, and revenue mobilization. Zero banking must be achieved if the four communities of Cockle Bay are to attain both certainty to stay and capacity to upgrade. And despite attempts such as the MOU and threats of eviction, clearly the process of land banking is still occurring. We have identified three points of improvement in the existing zero banking mechanisms which can help prevent further banking. Firstly, the whole community must have a common stance on zero banking. Therefore, community sensitization on acknowledging the need for zero banking must be widespread. This can be achieved in multiple ways, for example through initiatives by religious groups, youth groups and CBOs, but also by sharing success stories between the four communities in Cockle Bay where banking has decreased, such as in Jaimata. Secondly, existing zero banking enforcement and bylaws need to become more effective. Without effective enforcement, it is almost impossible to stop the process of banking. One way to achieve this is strengthening the existing police partnership which collaborates with the youth in the settlement and mobilizing it towards enforcing zero banking on the coast. Improving enforcement in such a way has the potential to effectively reduce land banking, given that it must come from within the community, but also has to be available at any given time, as banking often occurs at night. The wetland manager for her to take active responsibility to see that what was factored within the agreement, it happens. Because in the agreement, every three months, we get a consultative meeting. But since that time, it's not happening. It hasn't happened. Finally, restoring the mangrove population has multiple benefits in terms of achieving zero banking, but also to the community as a whole. The restored mangrove forest could act as an effective demarcation of the boundary limits, as the current demarcation poles are not very effective, given that they are not solid enough and can be moved. Moreover, restoring the mangrove population, and thus the wetland coastal ecosystem, is a way of establishing a nature-based solution to not only land banking, but also by increasing biodiversity in fish populations back to healthy levels. This, in turn, benefits the community in multiple ways, such as reducing health and sanitation risks related to the coast, and benefiting local fishermen by having more fish in their waters. Like, for instance, I will tell them the importance of mangroves. One, this mangrove mitigates the acid on the water. On the water. Yeah. He mitigates that acid. Two, he allow crabs and other fishes to lay their eggs to breed. Yeah. And other important birds will come to reside there. Uh -huh. Even the fishes, they will come to find uh, food. Yeah. Our second pillar addresses the issue of individual household upgrading. From our surveys, we classified 37% of houses as being of high vulnerability. Housing vulnerability also varied across the four settlements, with the settlement of J. Mata having the lowest housing vulnerability. Our focus group discussion revealed a healthy dynamic between tenants and landlords in J. Mata, with landlords discounting rent for tenants who had made improvements to their houses. This may explain the better housing quality in J. Mata in comparison to other settlements. Therefore, certainty to stay and capacity to upgrade can be improved by mutually advantageous tenant-landlord dynamics. Following this finding, we suggest these strategies to enhance individual household upgrading. Firstly, the community would need to establish an equitable tenancy agreement, which is comprehensive of the tenant's financial capacities. Secondly, Transform Freetown encourages the mapping of communities and needs. Our surveys have revealed that some parts of Cockle Bay are more vulnerable in terms of housing than others. For example, the community of Maffin Bay was revealed to have the most vulnerable housing. Hence, the City Council, with the goal of Transform Freetown in mind, could carry out a further vulnerability analysis to enable prioritisation of which areas within Cockle Bay need resources channelled for housing upgrading. The third pillar of our strategy addresses the upgrading of community services. Based on our findings, 45% of the residents are aware of community initiatives and only 10% are members of savings groups, meaning that there could be more room for improvement in membership in order for the four communities to effectively mobilize resources and improve basic access to services in Cocoa Bay. We have determined four key areas of focus for planning which are road accessibility, waste management, drainage improvement and water reticulation and sanitation. In order to plan for these improvements, our proposed alternatives are improved road accessibility to the community by rethinking the management of our four main roads and remaining two entry points to the settlement, mapped out during the final workshop in Mafembe. Secondly, improved waste management. 
As garbage collection in the agreed locations is not sufficient, most of the residents have to dump their waste in waterways and into their breeding creek. Hence, each of the four communities needs to establish at least two waste collection points to avoid waste dumping throughout the drainage system and further flooding. In order to do so, the waste collection points would each require at least one big bin, which cost approximately 1.5 million leons. Also, Cockle Bay can create community waste groups and increase awareness around the existing ones, such as the waste collection initiatives by groups such as Elite Youth, where young residents undergo training activities and mapping exercises and take collective responsibility for collecting waste. Regarding drainage and sewage management, dumping solid waste blocks the drains and increases the likelihood of localized flooding. Any week, I was at the case. Any week, you see? Stop here. Stop here. Stop here. Stop here. Yes. Yes. Wider and deeper gutters could be established to contain more water and cope better with waste. The potential provision of equipment, such as rain boots, coats and shovels, for collecting waste safely and effectively, and thus reducing the likelihood of flooding, could be achieved through a funding initiative by local savings groups. Next, water reticulation and sanitation. Throughout the four communities, there are nine communal water taps, which are already shared by 187 people each. Additionally, there are only two communal water collection points and two spring water wells. 90% of Freetown's water resources comes from the Guma Dam. The government has implemented an initiative for the rehabilitation of Freetown's water supply funded by UK Aid since 2017. This project aims at rehabilitating the Guma Valley water treatment and its transmission network in West Freetown and is led by the local government, communities, international agencies, NGOs and the private sector. For increased access to safe drinking water, Cocoa Bay would benefit from piped sub-connections to Guma. Hence, upgrading this system should be a priority. Moreover, rooftop rainwater collection with storage tanks for every household can be used as a short-term solution. Finally, collective action and advocacy could work towards adding public water tanks both over and underground while being evenly distributed in key spaces across Cocoa Bay. Additionally, based on our transit walk throughout the settlement, we found out that there are approximately only 12 communal hanging toilets, and we also know that approximately 5% of the residents still practice open defecation. Hence, collective action needs to emphasize the need for more compound and community toilets equally distributed across the four communities. Finally, the four pillars of the strategy addresses funding. Based on our group discussions with the residents, we found that the biggest challenge of operating community services are the limited financial resources available. From our surveys, we found that just 10% of residents were members of savings groups, while there are currently only eight functioning savings groups in Cockle Bay. The low rate of membership can be explained by reasons such as a lack of communication with residents, low transparency, and relatively small financial benefits in comparison to individual savings schemes. Until now, Upgrading basic services including sanitation and water supply have been implemented by CBOs and through external funding by organizations such as the Red Cross and Comic Relief. Moving on, basic services remain highly vulnerable across Cockle Bay. Based on our findings, we determine a potential budget for certain community services. As these prices are high, carrying out such upgrades will require a long-term payment commitment by the community for a period of 10 years with each household contributing 10,740 leons per year. The total cost estimating for upgrading of basic services on a community level in the whole of Cockle Bay would be approximately 145 million leons. Furthermore, to address the community's financial challenges, our strategy for funding aims to highlight the need for increasing transparency and accountability within and between different savings groups in order to restore trust and effectiveness to fully maximize the community's financial assets and capacities. A community-led infrastructure finance facility, CLIF, based on international funding. This program could provide financial support to NGOs and CBOs in Cockle Bay who do not have access to mainstream housing funding. This scheme could also be used to initiate small-scale demonstration projects in order to secure funding for larger, longer-term projects. Member could save at least a minimum amount or share per period and ask for a loan up to a limit defined by the aiming of savings help. The total amount of savings could then be redistributed at the end of a cycle, so members would be able to create the fund to be used for community upgrading or in post-disaster situations. Taking into account the experience provided in Tanzania by the Village Savings and Loans Association, 
BLSA, this approach could be used to boost women's economic status, as by saving and accessing microloans through BSLAs, women have been able to invest in small businesses and farming, which resulted in improving their children's education, health, and the livelihood of the entire family. In sum, the four pillars of our strategy will hopefully enable the residents of Cockle Bay to remain in the community by enhancing their certainty to stay and capacity to upgrade. However, in order for the strategy to be effective, it requires planning in terms of organizing its future progression. We have categorized the points made under each pillar of our strategy into their corresponding phases based on priority and or their estimated time of completion. This entails clearly setting out its three phases, the short term, which would be about one year, the middle term, which would be around three years, and the expected outcomes in the long term, which would be five or more years. Finally, due to the interrelation of the four pillars, their outcomes, collectively, would lead to establishing both certainty to stay and capacity to upgrade in a risk-free cockle bay. To conclude, our research was an attempt to determine how certainty to stay and capacity to upgrade could potentially be achieved throughout the four communities of Jemata, Kolatri, Mafembe and Ilet View, through improvements within the four areas of zero banking, individual upgrading, community upgrading and funding. Moreover, our work also attempted to build upon the action-oriented citywide plans of the MOU, CAP and Transform Freetown, in order to further contribute to the recent trend of transformative initiatives focusing on Cocoa Bay. Considering the above, it must be noted that there were some limitations in our work that could be improved for future research. The fear of eviction present in most of the tenants acted as a barrier in obtaining genuine answers to certain questions of our survey. Another limitation of our work was the complexity of the current savings group scheme, both on a community and a local government level, making it difficult to get a sense of the funding needed to improve Cocoa Bay settlement services and infrastructures. We hope our work will contribute to the research conducted by SLURC in the settlements of Freetown and further build on the alliance with the DPU. Let we come together for Cocoa Bay. Thank you.